Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Musa Abala Al Karim. I'm the coordinator of the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa webinar series. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this new initiative. As you know, SONA is a non for profit organization dedicated to promoting research and teaching of neuroscience in Africa and also functions as an umbrella organization for the regional and national neuroscience society in Africa. In this first webinar, we are very fortunate to, to be joined by a rising African star in neuroscience, uh, Karin uh, Gimni, who is going to talk about the basic principle of immunohistochemistry, the do's and, and, and don'ts. So let me say a few things about her background. <laughs> Uh, Karen is a research fellow at the University of Hospital of Wolfsburg in Germany. I don't know if I pronounce it well or not. She has a broad background in neuroscience with a specific training expertise in molecular neuroscience, neuroplasticity, neurohabilitation. She obtained her master's degree at the CNR CNRS, University of Nice, Sophia, Antipolis in France, and she completed her PhD at the Institute at the Institute of Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology in France also. Uh, she has received numerous awards, including the prestigious uh, L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Award. Karin is also engaged in uh, science outreach and science capacity building in Africa. And she, recent, she has recently co-organized an April school in Cameroon and contributes actively to the mentoring of many young African scientists. Uh, before we get started, I just would like to remind our audience that this webinar is designed to be interactive and they can ask as many questions as they want by simply typing their questions on the comment section of this YouTube live streaming. And Karen will respond to their questions during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Uh, Karin, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for taking time, time out of your busy schedule to join us today. And now I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the thorough introduction. And uh, yeah, what do I have on my agenda today to share with you? Um, we're going to talk about a basic principle of immunochemistry. Uh, so I hope I'm doing this right. Are you able, are everybody able to see my screen now? To see the slides? No, I no. see your slides, so. Okay, so I've been, I've been uh, training with Mossab <laughs> about this, but uh, yes, normally now you should be able to see. Mm. Donna? Not yet. Oh. All right. Oh, let's see, let me redo this again. So, okay. Wow. Doesn't look like it's working, but I will do my best to get you to that. Not any, no, you still don't see anything. Uh, we saw the slide, but now it disappeared again. Oh, sorry about that. Um, let me redo this again. So you should be able to see if, no? Not yet, actually. Um, well, I did exactly what you taught me a minute ago, <laughs> and uh, so that must have something to do with my uh, with my computer. Actually, that has nothing to do with. Uh, 
I'm getting uh, something wrong. So I hope that has nothing to do with the privacy policy of the the clinic here, but. Uh, So let me redo this again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what you told me is to open and then go to sh to share. Yeah, application window. Yeah. Select. Yeah, select um, the presentation that's already in presentation mode, right? Okay, then you have to go through Alt and Tab. I did that. And click on the presentation. Yeah, yeah, the presentation in uh, slideshow mode the, because you have two choices. Click on the presentation that shows slideshow mode and share. You have to share. Yeah, which is what uh, I just did. Uh, but I'm unable to see my presentation in share mode. Are you able to see something? Yeah, uh, we are able to see, but not in slide show mode. But you can continue like this also. But are you able to see the slide mode now? Yeah, not now you can see. No. I can see the slide, but not on a slide show. So, but you can continue. I think it is also possible to continue in this way. Well, I'm very uh, sorry about that. Um, I will do a last try if you <laughs> allow me. Guess it's really a pity that it doesn't work. Um, but I would also first of all open the presentation, mm -hmm. and then go to the hangout and share it. So, let me go. yeah, for some reason I'm unable to see. As long as long as I move there, I'm unable to see the. Okay. So, are you able to see? Yeah, I'm able to yes. see now. Yeah. Okay, so I hope the resolution is not that not bad. Um, sorry about the delay. So, like I said, um, I'm going to share with you some basic principles of immunohistochemistry. And then towards the end of the presentation, uh, we can discuss some, some do's and don'ts. So this is basically our eye outline. Um, I'll give a brief introduction, many historical introduction, and then I will cover the general principle of immunohistochemistry. Then we will discuss some critical aspects of the different detection methods, uh, sample preparation, and the standing procedure. So please note that we will mainly discuss um, here, the preparation of tissue sample, uh, actually mainly brain sample from vertebrates. Unfortunately, I will not cover in this presentation the preparation of samples from flies or culture cells. Uh, but if some of you are using those models and are experiencing some issues, uh, please just leave your questions in the chat and uh, I will try to find the answer for you. I hope you're able to follow me. I hope you're still able to follow me here. So, why are people using uh, immunohistochemistry? Immunohistochemistry is used to demonstrate the antigen and most of the time, the antigen is a protein. Uh, and we can find that the antigen or demonstrate the antigen in cells and tissue. So it's a technique that allows a specific binding. An antigen is uh, typically a substance, most of the time, a protein or a polysaccharide. And uh, an antigen can generate a specific immune response and induce the formation of a specific antibody. Therefore, for immunohistochemistry, we will use antibody. So the antigen will be then found in its exact location, so that's a special location, by using a specific reaction with an antibody 
uh, and the antibody is specific and that can be done by many different chemicals. So immunohistochemistry has a specificity component. The one advantage of immunohistochemistry is that uh, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the structure of the cell and the tissue is preserved. And we can also use the technique to identify cellular events like excitotoxicity, apoptosis, acetosis, and so on. So immunohistochemistry is not a brand new technique. The principle exists since the 1930s, and some of the first experiments were done by Kuhn and colleagues where they demonstrated uh, the presence of streptococcus pneumonia antigens in tissue sections by using specific antibodies which were linked uh, to a fluorescent label. Later on, Nakan and Pierce uh, reported also the use of a secondary antibody conjugated with host radish peroxidase enzyme. So they actually developed an indirect method of detection. In the 80s, Sternberger described the peroxidase antiperoxidase method, and later on, some other colleagues defined the method of evident biotin peroxidase complex, which is uh, usually abbreviated as ABC method. This is a method that's commonly used in immunohistochemistry. More recently, in the years 2000, there have been many recent developments in multiplexing techniques for immunohistochemistry, uh, specifically, for example, with mass spectrometry, uh, spectrometry and so on. So immunohistochemistry is a very used method. Uh, when, if we type, for example, immunohistochemistry in Medline, the count of publication is very high. I just graphed here quickly uh, the results that I obtained from Medline when I just entered immunohistochemistry. So this is the count of publications, the count of publications around, about, and or using immunohistochemistry since 1960s. Obviously here between 2016 and 2019, we see a drop, but this is just because it's just four years and we're still in the middle of 2019. So definitely it's a very used method and the method has several advantages. That's why it's important for us in neuroscience uh, to know how to perform this technique. So immunohistochemistry can be used for several applications. Uh, most uh, commonly to detect protein, carbohydrate, nuclear acids and lipids. Uh, it can be used to determine the type of, secret of the secreting source, uh, to identify or to exhibit membrane antigens, structural antigens that are found in the cytoplasm, or even antigens that are localized in the nucleus. And for the detection, once we have the target, uh, uh, the, we can detect uh, the, the expression of those antigens using different methods like microscopy, fluorescent microscopy, confocal laser scanning, even electron microscopy. Here I have just uh, summarized some of the standard uh, steps uh, to immunohistochemistry. We're not in the, the slide share mode unfortunately, but here I hope the slide is not too busy. What we can say is that Usually, you start your experiment by harvesting your sample. This is done in the biopsy room or in your dissecting room. After that, you will go from your animal uh, uh, that you have uh, from from the sample that you have harvested, and you go to the second room where you can perform different uh, post-processing uh, experiment. For example, uh, perfusing, uh, uh, freezing, and so on. So I've uh, uh, mentioned here, you can see in green, 
from your bowel serum and your crossing area. You can perform your surgery of interest. You can dissect your tissue or you can perfuse your tissue. Some people perfuse their animals using paraformaldehyde, for example, to fix the tissue. And then after that step, you can harvest your tissue of interest and then you can use some post-processing methods depending on what you're planning to do in your experiment. For example, using paraffin, freezing, or for cryosto sectioning, sectioning, for example, or simply using your fresh tissue and use the vibratome to section. We're going to see that again later on. So after that step, you perform your immuno labeling. So immuno staining that can be using a chromophore or a fluorescent label. And then the next step is in the reporting area where you quantify uh, your results and you can do qualitative, quantitative analysis or both. Some people usually uh, plan the experiment in advance using stereology method to harvest their tissue and to mount the tissue on the section that will allow them a standardized approach during the qualitative and quantitative analysis later on. So before studying, uh, you actually need to care about several factors. Again, unfortunately here, uh, we cannot see the, the, the slide, uh, but you have to care about several aspects. One aspect is the tissue per se. For example, the section size, the thickness of the section. What is your target? Is your target at the surface? Is it an intracell in, in an intracellular location? Do you need to perfuse your animals, for example? What type of fixation agent do you want to use? Are you going to use a direct or an indirect labeling method? Which type of antibody is going to allow you to detect your tar target without bringing a lot of background? And labeling is also important and labeling can be influenced by the equipment also. If you only have a light microscope and no fluorescence microscope, for example, well, you will aim for experiment where you're not using a fluorochrome, you're using a chromogenic agent instead, for, its, for instance. Here, we can just see the general principle of a, an immunohistochemistry experiment from the beginning to the end. So first you have your tissue, you have your tissue that you have harvested, and then you perform your experiment, staining and detection, and after that you move to the microscope for visualization, and then you perform your quality and can take this analysis. And for each of these steps, um, there are several things to pay attention to. We've been talking about an antigen that has to be detected using an antibody. But what is an antibody? An antibody, also known as immunoglobulin, is a Y-shaped glycoprotein produced by the immune system to neutralize pathogens. And you can see here the typical form of an antibody in a Y-shaped arm. Those arms are called the binding parts. And you have a variable region, which is the fat variable region. That region is important in recognizing and binding the antigen. So depending on the shape of the antigen here, you can see we have different colors of antigens with different shapes. We have here purple, red, uh, green, orange, yellow, blue shape. And as we can see, only the yellow shape will be able to actually bind uh, to the antibody. So this, this is the specificity of the antibody. In immunohistochemistry, an antibody can be polyclonal or monoclonal. What does that mean? A polyclonal antibody is typically generated from multiple B cells. 
So the anti the the, the antibody has multiple epitopes of the same antigen. And what would that then have as implication? An antigen antibody binding would be then less affected by the confirmation change of the antigen during the immunohistochemistry preparation. We perform different steps, fixation, for example, freezing, perfusion. All those steps can actually affect the conformation of the antigen. If you're using a polyclonal antibody, then you're less bound to those conformation changes. A polyclonal antibody also has the advantage that it can enhance the signal. It, it's also easy to produce and cheaper. It can be raised in different hosts, like rabbit, guinea pig, goat, or sheep. But as you can imagine, a polyclonal antibody also has some uh, negative aspects. So a polyclonal antibody can bring noise and can increase the background of the staining because the specificity is low. There is also a high variability from batch to batch. So from the same company, you might get a different batch and find that the concentration of the antibody has to be modified in order to get um, adequate staining. And they, they also the antibody is less useful for probing specific domain of an antigen uh, because of the anti-serum we will usually recognize in many domains. I've put here the typical walking range, so this is not universal, but the concentration of the polyclonal antibody is usually between 1.7 and 15 microgram per milliliter. So uh, we can use uh, the polyclonal antibody as a, at a pretty low concentration. On contrary, a monoclonal antibody is generated from a single B cell, so from a single B cell clone, and has only a single epitope of an antigen. So, good thing about this is that we have a less lot to lot variability. We have a highly specific and less cross-reactive protein, and we also have reduced non-specific binding in background in the stem. But this is also difficult to produce or to use, and it is expensive. Most monoclonal antibodies are usually raised in mice only, so depending of, uh, on the tissue that we're using, we might have problem using monoclonal antibody. The epitope may not be shared across a range of species, and also it is more, more vulnerable to the loss of epitope through any type of treatment that we might have done during your immunohistochemistry you know, preparation. And as opposed to polyclonal antibody, usually you need a high concentration of the antibody to be able to have some detection. So the typical concentration range is between 5 and 25 micrograms per milliliter. So what would be the characteristic of a good antibody? Because the antibody is the critical ingredient, so the critical component of your immunohistochemistry experiment. A good antibody should have high affinity to an antigen. It should have high binding property that is called activity. And the titration of the antibody should also be high. So you would ask me how to find a good antibody when planning my experiment. So one thing that we can do is to use search engine to compare between different antibodies that has been used for my application of interest. And then you have to match the antibody to your application, which means, for example, don't take an antibody used for Western blood and directly assume that it would work for an immunohistochemistry experiment because it might not work. Buy your antibody from a company that will support you in troubleshooting. Some companies can give you some few microliters for troubleshooting experiment free of cost. 
And also, when we don't have some already established protocols in the lab, it's also wise to look for antibody that already have validated data, for example, in publications. And very, very important is also to check the additive list in the antibody when purchasing a commercial antibody, for example, because some antibodies uh, contain some conservative, for example, sodium azide, and sodium azide can interfere, for example, with your HLP conjugate antibodies and might actually affect the quality of the detection that you will have at the end of your experiment. There are several methods uh, uh, for labeling uh, in immunohistochemistry, and that's what we're going to see now. So the antibody labeling method can be direct, indirect, and many more. What does it mean by direct method? A direct method of labeling would be a method that contains only one step. Direct detection means that the primary antibody will actually bind directly to the tissue antigen, and usually that primary antibody is already fluorescent or is labeled with an enzyme that's fluorescent, which means in one step you're able to see the antigen of, of interest. So this method is fast with few steps, but there is a but. You may lack the sensitivity for the visualization of lower expressed antigen. So although this method eliminates concerns regarding non-specific binding, that can occur with secondary antibody, for example, if you have an antigen that's difficult to detect, this might not be the way to go. An indirect method of detection contains at least two steps. The first step is binding the primary antibody to the tissue antigen, and then the second step is to bind the secondary antibody to the primary antibody. So an enzyme labeled secondary antibody will actually react with a non-conjugate primary antibody that, and that antibody is itself bound to the tissue antigen lower. So with this method, you have a credit sensitivity, you have a more intense signal, and you also have more flexibility compared to the direct detection method that we saw previously. This is actually the most common way to proceed in immunohistochemistry. Another way of detection could be to use a non-labeled method and proceed with an amplification later on. What does this mean? This means that you perform a normal experiment with an indirect method, so the primary antibody binding to the tissue antigen followed by the secondary antibody bound to the primary antibody, but those antibodies are unlabeled. And then you will use a preformed enzyme immune complex that is able to react with your secondary antibody in order to produce a signal. And that uh, in immune complex could be butyl apatine peroxidase, so the ABC system, Biotin streptavidin, and this is the preferred method because it showed a better tissue penetration because of the uh, small size of the complex. And with this method, you actually even increase the sensitivity when compared to the traditional indirect method. The only problem or the only aspect to pay attention to is that you may need to block endogenous biotin to limit non-specific binding. And most of the time, the immune complex are big and they may limit tissue penetration of the antibody. So the fourth method of labeling is the labeled method. So this is a method, the method of the horse radish peroxidase. 
So a long death strain of polymer is labeled to the secondary antibody and then to a multiple enzyme molecule. Again, here we have a big complex that is going to be used for the detection. But this method is a very powerful method because it shows a greater sensitivity compared to the APC and the SAB method. It actually has fewer steps than an ABC and LSB method. And you have to apply a chromogen like uh, diaminobenzidine after the secondary antibody incubation. And this type of detection can allow you to do like microscopy instead of fluorescence microscopy. So now we've been talking about uh, the method per se, uh, the technical aspect of the method. But now we're going to move forward and we're going to get into the do's and the don'ts when you want to perform an immunohistochemistry experiment. So we've been discussing the principles. Now we're going to get into the detail of the do's and don'ts. So we want to perform a multiplex immunohistochemistry. First steps is to choose the primary antibody that is raised in a different species than the tissue that you uh, than that the tissue of interest. And then most importantly, the secondary antibody that is going to bind to your primary antibody should come from the same host species. For the blocking steps, the blocking serum should come from the same species in which the secondary has been raised in order to reduce non-specific binding and background. And then, important is to use the brightest fluoro form in order to, uh, to use the brightest fluoro for low abundant proteins. And if you have a protein that's very abundant, it's better to use the fluoro for that's not that bright. Otherwise, you will have too, uh, you have a lot of background and you won't be able to actually uh, quantify your protein properly. Also, it is important to use fluorophore with narrow emission spectra in order to avoid bleed through between your fluorophore. So there is a compromise to find, to find here. Narrow band pass filter comes at the cost of lower signal, but even when you have narrow band pass filter, the emission from one fluorophore can bleach and go through the detection channel intended for another one. And yeah, depending on the microscope, you might encounter this problem more often. Um, what, do, what do I mean by, by pass filter and emission spectra? So here, if you look, you will see that we have here different relative intensity and different wavelengths where you will have the emission of a special fluorochrome. For example, DAPI, Alexa 3048, Alexa 3555, and so on. So it's wise when doing multiplex experiment to use filter, uh, to use a chromophore that are really white uh, uh, apart in terms of emission spectrum. For example, if you're using the Alexa 55, uh, 555, as you can see, there is an overlap between the Alex Fluoro 488 and the Alex Fluoro 555. So depending on the protein you're looking for, it might be wise to choose Alexa Fluoro 488, for example, and Alexa Fluoro 647 when doing multiplex experiment. At least you have two clear signals that are very separate in emission spectra, so you will have a green color and a red color, and you will actually minimize the risk of having bleach through. One thing that's very important is that you should always make controls, especially when you're troubleshooting your experiment when you're starting. So which type of controls are really important or are recommended? The positive control. The positive control is used to confirm the presence of the antigen. 
So you can choose a tissue that already has the proper signal. The tissue negative control, for example, can be a tissue that has nothing to do with the tissue you're looking for, with the protein you're looking for. So a tissue where you're pretty sure that you will not find the protein of interest, then you can use that tissue as negative control. Or you can use I mean, uh, immunoglobulin from the, spe the same species, but immunized against a non-biologic molecule, for example. So you can use BRD antibody on animals that were not injected with BRD. And if you see BRD, then you're running into a problem. So this is for the tissue controls. But it's also important to make some antibodies controls, for example, choosing one section where you don't put the primary antibody and then choose or one slide where you don't put the primary antibody and then you will just put the secondary antibody and perform the rest of the experiment. Do another experiment where you are not putting the secondary, for example, or you can also do some absorption control with inactivated primary antibody if you have a, an inactivated primary uh, antibody uh, available. So here we can see in the figure, this is a figure from a primary antibody control in human kidney. This is from Novus Biological. And we can see here that with primary antibody, we have the labeling, we have the markers here in, in uh, um, brown. And we can really see here the, the cells in the kidney and without primary antibody, there is no labeling. And this is how the negative control should look like, the no primary, no signal. So let's go back to the figure that I presented earlier. We have talked about the standard steps of uh, an immunohistochemistry. Now what I would like to do is just to take you through the important steps of a typical experiment. <coughs> the first steps would be the sample preparation, decapitation, dissection, and again, the dissection, the faster, the better in many more steps because the longer your tissue sits on your bench, the more you're getting autolysis of your tissue and uh, that can really affect the quality of your experiment. Depending on the antibody and the antigens that you're looking for, maybe to a paraformaldehyde a perfusion before dissection might also be recommended. After that, the sectioning the tissue and the pretreatment of the tissue will determine the storage. Then we move to staining. So we've mentioned here fixation for, with paraformaldehyde. What does that mean? The fixation here can be performed in different uh, ways. Fixation by perfusion is ideal for small animals and it also brings a more uniform fixation, but it's also possible to perform a fixation by immersing uh, the tissue and then cut really thin slices. The standard fixative are aldehyde, like paraformaldehyde in PPS buffer is common, alcohol or acetone. What is really important also is that it's always good and recommended to cryoprotect your tissue in circles after your fixation before the freezing steps. For sectioning, you can use different methods. You can use microtome for paraffin uh, uh, blocks. You can use cryoster for sections that have been forced, uh, uh, that have been forced in isopentane, for example. And the vibratome is usually used for a fresh tissue. So this is good if you're performing an immunohistochemistry in floating section, for example, in wells. So your sections are not mounted on a slide. Instead, you're doing it in wells. So vibratum will be then a good way uh, of sectioning your tissue. Very important is also the storage. The storage can substantially affect the quality of your staining. 
So for long-term preservation, it is recommended to use paraffin method because you can store your slides uh, at room temperature for a long time. What is really important is that before starting your immunohistochemistry, because your slides were at room temperature, you have to perform a rehydration step. It is also possible to freeze the tissue and frozen tissue can be stored for about a year at minus 80 degrees. The difficulty here is that once the tissue is frozen, uh, we, it's difficult to get a five micron metal section thick, for example, then we have to go for thicker sections. Frozen tissue after fixation in paraformaldehyde and after cryoprotection using sucrose can be stored also at minus 80 degrees, but it's also possible to store them in the normal fridge if you're planning to stain your section uh, shortly after sectioning. And this is important to mention because if you, you plan your experiment in the next weeks, it's may, it's maybe more um, it's wiser to uh, store your sections in the fridge. That would also avoid that you have to thaw and refreeze some of your section because we free a uh, thawing and refreeze, refreezing will actually also affect the quality of your experiment. Now let's get to the staining. Some staining might require some antigen retrieval. Why? Because after this fixation, if you're using a fixative like paraformaldehyde, then the fixation can modify the antigen. The fixative can also mask the epitope of your antigen and can create some cross link and therefore restricting the penetration and the, the linking of your antibody to your target. And you will see in some protocols this uh, antigen anti anti retrieval. How can we perform that? That can be performed using proteolytic induced epitope retrieval. So this is done with an enzyme, or that can be also done using heat. Here is a, a figure from the laboratory of tanks where they look at the ventricular zone, the expression of a different antigen uh, in the uh, subventricular zone of a rat at postnatal one. And you can see in the first row that they have done some antigen retrieval steps in doing their immunohistochemistry. And you can clearly see the signal. Well, you can see here the staining with BLDU, with PAC6, with HUSH, and the duolib, the co-labeling of BRDU with the with PAC6. However, in the row below, so the row D1, D2, D3, D4, where they didn't perform any pretreatment, there is no expression. So we don't have any signal. This is just to emphasize that this is really important, depending of the, on the protocol and on the, the pretreatment that you apply to your tissue to perform an antigen retrieval step. Another important step in the staining is the permeabilization step. Why? Because the permeabilization step will improve antibody penetration especially for the, the antigens and the proteins that are in the cytoplasm or in the nuclear, in the, in the nucleus, because there sometimes the epitope is masked and with the permeabilization, you will allow a better penetration of your antibody. And this is usually done using some detection, detergent like Triton X or the twin. But Again, do not use the permeabilization step if you're looking for a membrane protein, right? Because if you're looking for a membrane protein and you're using permeabilization, you might actually wipe completely the epitope because of the detergent effect on your tissue. It's also possible to combine several detergent uh, 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 during the the immunohistochemistry uh, 
during during the beginning process. And acetone and methanol, which are sometimes also used as a permeabilizing agent, would precipitate the protein that are outside cell membrane. So those agents are to use with care. So we have to be careful there. Another important step of the staining is the blocking step. Why is it important to perform this step? Well, because blocking, using the serum to block your tissue will reduce the bed frame and we also reduce some non-specific staining. How is it performed? Usually between 30 uh, minutes to overnight at room temperature of 4 degrees. And that is done with normal serum, for example, or with a protein solution like uh, bovine serum albumin, gelatin, or milk. So the important or advantage of using uh, BSA gelatin or milk is that it's cheap, it's cheap and it's easy to make. But we should pay attention again that the blocking buffer is free of any precipitate or contaminant. Why am I saying that? Because sometimes in the lab, uh, uh, the, 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 the non-fat dried milk is prepared and left over on the bench. And then after some few days, use that sometimes you have then pieces and precipitate in the milk and if you pour that on the slides well you're going to have those little crystals on your tissue and this is going to affect actually the quality of your staining well if you choose to use a serum well it's really important to use the serum which is from the source basic of the secondary antibody. So if you use a good secondary antibody, you have to choose a good serum or so. And there are commercial buffers that are ready to go and ready to use. This is probably the best option, but depending on the resources of the lab, that can be also expensive. Very, very important, you can use the same blocking buffer for diluting your antibody that you've been using for your blocking steps. This is also to minimize the background. Now, uh, we have seen the principle of immunohistochemistry and we have went through some critical steps what we have to pay attention to. Now, what I would like to do is to describe an example of protocol, uh, an example of typical protocol that will be an experiment where we aim to label, to do a triple labeling of BRDU double coating and the UN in the dental journals of red. BRDU is an agent that can integrate in the DNA and will actually allow us to follow the cell proliferation. Double coating is a marker of immature neurons and NUN is a marker of mature neurons. So those three uh, antibodies are typically used in neurogenesis experiment, for example, or in any type of experiment where we are looking at the development of neurons or of adult neurons. So let's go through this protocol. The first steps, as we already heard several times, is to prepare yourself for. For this experiment, we need to perform an intracardial perfusion with 4% formaldehyde. After that, we will, dis we will dissect the brain of, uh, of the rat, and then we will immerse the brain into a fixative overnight. After that step, we have to cryoprotect our tissue. We do that using 20% sucrose with volume in phosphate buffer. And then we freeze the brain using isoprotent that has been, uh, well, we use the, the cold isoprotent. And then we will perform, because those sections are frozen, they can be sectioned on a cryostat. So we perform cryo uh, sectioning on a cryostat at a thickness of 20 microns. Then the section will be mounted on gelatin-coated slides. 
Because we are planning to do the experiment in the next future, we can store the slides in the fridge. And before starting the experiment, we can use a special a pen to circle the section. So this special pen is a pop pen. So this pen uh, actually will maintain your section moist during the experiment and we actually uh, 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 avoid the liquid that you put on your section to leak out. So it's kind of sealing the area where you're going to perform your experiment. And this comes very handy because it also allows you to reduce the volume of antibody that you have to prepare for your experiment. So once you've performed these steps, we will go for an antigen retrieval uh, uh, step using citric buffer at 90 degrees for 15 minutes. So again, the pH here is really important. The pH of the citric buffer has to be exactly at 6 because the pH can also affect the epitope of your, the quality of the epitope of your antigen. So the fourth step would be to block, to use a blocking solution. So here for this experiment, for example, we're going to use a donkey serum triplicate. So remember, the, the serum that you're using for blocking should have nothing to do with the antigens that you're looking for. And the host of, uh, so the origin of the serum also should be different from the tissue that you're using. So we're using raw tissue here, then we can use the serum. And then we prepare a cocktail of primary antibody in this donkey serum, diluted in this donkey serum. So pay attention here, we have a cocktail of primary antibody and in orange you can see rat, goat and mouse. So each antibody has to be coming from a different species. The, sixth, the sixth that is the incubation of the secondary antibody for four hours at room temperature, again in the same blocking solution added with 320 hydrochloric remainder. 320 is a detergent used for permeabilization. And we have been talking about the serum, and we said that the serum should be from the same species as the secondary antibody. And this is exactly what we have to do here uh, for this experiment. We are using antibodies that had been raised in donkey, so the same spacing as the blocking serum. And this is the result. We can see here in green uh, the BLDU labeling in red double coating and in blue NUN. And then when we do an overlay here, on the fourth uh, square, we can see here the blue, the red, and the green. And we can see that some neurons uh, that are here in, uh, in uh, uh, green also, are also co-label with the red. I hope you can see that. So this is an example of protocols, uh, of protocol for a multiplex immunohistochemistry. Now, what can we do when things go wrong? So we can use different tips to troubleshoot. Troubleshooting, for example, the primary antibody. So important to choose a primary antibody that has a high titration. We have to control for the concentration and also the incubation time of the antibody. Really important to use a timer. So. Uh, uh, and actually exactly follow the time uh, that you've been troubleshooting for the incubation. If you're doing like that staining, for example, don't let your dab on your tissue for too long. For example, here I have put two, the, two, one example of a dab staining that went too long on the uh, right side and a perfect dab staining on the left side. We can have also other problems like uh, too much background staining because we didn't 
actually pay attention whether or not we had some endogenous biotin. So many organs contain abundant endogenous biotin or, or enzymes that can lead to non-specific staining. Again, some uh, uh, some people also experience uh, uh, the section drying. So why does that happen? Because sometimes we want to perform many, we want to stain many slides at once. The tip here, the rule of thumb would be to make not more than four slides for AC at each time, unless you're using really those little racks and then you, you're um, uh, being careful that the sections are always wet. Again, using a pack pen when available could be also a good solution. It is important to wash and clear your section, your slides with PBCS. And if you have to do a, hydrat a, hydrat a hydration step, it's also important to perform that before starting the experiment. Regarding the blocking buffer, it's important to choose a non immune serum that is. Re, uh, coming from the same species as the second antibody. And if we still have issue, for example, all the slides show negative results where maybe we missed a step in the IG or forgot an antibody, or maybe there was sodium azide in the buffer. Sometimes we put some sodium azide to, to, to actually uh, prevent the mold from growing in the buffer, but then you should not use this buffer for your IHC. All the slides are showing positive results. Maybe the slides are too dry, or maybe your antibody was too concentrated, or you've been using long incubation time or inappropriate pH buffer. If you're having a high background, while well, maybe your slides are too thick, so you didn't get enough antibody penetration, so you're getting unspecific staining, or your peroxidase, the endogenous peroxidase were not blocked, insufficient time of rinse, so the rinsing steps are also important, too long staining or bad dilution can be also one of the reasons. So to conclude here, IHC is a very powerful technique, but the technique has to be really well performed because uh, it has also several weaknesses. What is important, what I would recommend, uh, from my experience here, it's always to plan your essay well before acquiring it. The tissue, use good, good blocking, and use lock your troubleshooting steps in your lab book. Quantify, especially using stereology, can be very long, but it's also recommended. And image acquisition and analysis might require advanced skills, but one can be trained to that, and maybe we can discuss that the, the, the next time. It's always important to combine immunohistochemistry results with another method like Western blotting and fax analysis when possible. So here I just summarized some useful resources uh, where uh, you, can, um, you can go and look for different protocols or you can inform yourself even further about immunohistochemistry. And with that, I will thank you for your attention. Uh, this is our beautiful campus, and I'll be ready to take some questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. We really enjoyed it so much. Uh, let me see if we have some questions from our audience, our comments, and then uh, we will answer them. Uh, meanwhile, you can also stop sharing your uh, PowerPoint so people can see you. <laughs> So you still have the PowerPoint, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Now you can see me. Yeah. Now you. Okay. Wonderful. So let me see if we have some questions. We don't have uh, actually questions right now. Uh, but maybe we can wait a bit, or like one or two minutes, to see if someone has questions. Uh, okay. So, 
would you like to provide like closing remarks before meanwhile so we can we can uh, have some, some questions from our audience during this time if not then we can conclude and and uh, well um well like i said um it's difficult to cover a specific protocol uh, because uh, you can use uh, immunohistochemistry in so many uh, ways and depending on, on the tissue of interest and also on the antigen of interest, you might have or may not have to perform some of the steps that I listed. So in terms of remark, what I would say is just um, for each specific in, uh, uh, experiment to always really prepare well in advance, especially in labs where maybe there is no routine protocols already established. Uh, when you're in the troubleshooting steps, it might be very difficult uh, to get you know the exact quality of staining that you're looking for. Yeah, you know, I just encourage uh, the young investigator not to discourage themselves so, and uh, yeah, to reach for. for for PIs or for resources, there are a lot of resources available. And again, like I said, if there's some people who have been using flyers or have been using cells, for example, and they have questions, yeah, they can reach out and we can always find the people who know how to do those things and they can share their knowledge with them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I just would like also to remind our audience that this webinar will be available in our in our YouTube uh, channel, the YouTube of uh, the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa, and so they can come back to this uh, video at any time and watch it. Uh, let me see again if someone has any question or comment or feedback or anything. Uh, Professor Ahmadi is asking uh, if you could provide advice on uh, joint research on cost of antibodies. If I could provide advice, advice on what? Advice on uh, joint research on cost of antibodies. I'm not sure I get the question. Uh, so what does he mean? Uh, if possible, to do you think we can share the antibodies or the share the cost of uh, research of? Uh, ah, okay. Like you mean, this is more a general question, not really regarding yeah, the cost, no, no, but no. more, more if uh, like if we have an antibody in the lab and then we are able to share it uh, and such things. Is that? Yeah. I think, I think uh, it is. yeah. Well. Well, that really depends on what uh, he's looking for. And in terms of actually traveling, like for Samadhi is in, in Nigeria, right? In, in South in, Africa. Uh, in South Africa. So one thing that I would pay attention to is, for example, to ship antibodies. Obviously, we already have that problem uh, where we had some custom, well, uh, one of my colleagues also had a problem where they had a custom antibody. So this was a lab-made antibody. So that was not a commercial antibody that was shipped from the USA. And uh, it went at the custom and they couldn't actually receive the antibody because it was uh, the, uh, well, there's some policies around those things. So it might be, I don't know what the regulation is, but like, for example, you cannot send it some grains, you cannot send plants, you cannot, uh, unless you really have a specific agreement, you cannot send those things. So, but sharing the cost, that's a different thing. This is a matter of collaboration. If you have a collaboration, then uh, you can order the, the antibody and somebody else pay the bill for it. That, then you get the antibody well conditioned and in, in a well shape for your experiment. Then in terms of like sh uh, shipping microliters of antibodies, uh, I'll be careful about that, especially if it's going uh, through uh, well, the shipping agent, you know, if it's not like traveling the suitcase of somebody, for example, I'll be careful. 
yeah. So, but this this is the possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, still, we don't have many questions, so maybe we can conclude this webinar and. Let me see. Let me say on behalf of Sona, I just want to thank all of our audience for joining us today. I would like also to thank uh, Karim and for this uh, nice talk. Um, bye for now. Yeah.